I want you to hit me as hard as you can. At a time when Marvel was dominating and DC was still trying to figure it out, along came a merry bunch of criminals called the Suicide Squad. They had one job, save the world or die trying. So how did a movie with a strong ensemble cast, an experienced filmmaker, and one of the most iconic villains in comic book history fail to hit the target? Grab your favorite bat and take a swing at what the fuck happened to this movie? The year 1989 ushered in a new era of comic book blockbusters, with Tim Burton's Batman showcasing a darker tone while still appealing to a mass audience. That influence carried through the 1990s, with comic adaptations like The Crow, Spawn, and Blade. But the notorious Batman and Robin was a nipple-suited speed bump for comic movies, while Marvel was busy selling off its most prized characters to various studios in order to avoid bankruptcy. Then, after the turn of the century, the release of X-Men and Spider-Man demonstrated that comic book franchises were still viable at the box office. This prompted Warner Brothers, the owners of DC Comics, to relaunch one of their biggest properties. I'm Batman. The studio turned to up-and-coming filmmaker Christopher Nolan to craft a new take on The Dark Knight. The massive worldwide success of Nolan's vision, further elevated by an unforgettable and award-winning Heath Ledger performance, showed that comic book movies were back in a big way. Around this time, Marvel Studios had begun looking through the remaining characters they still held the rights to, searching for a new hero to thrust onto the big screen. Enter Iron Man, and with it, two minutes that would change movies for the foreseeable future. Because once the end credits finished rolling on that 2008 release, we witnessed Nick Fury break into Tony Stark's house to inform him of the Avengers Initiative, giving birth to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you're asking yourself, what does that have to do with Suicide Squad? The simple answer is, well, a lot. With Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy wrapping up, Warner Brothers was searching for their next big franchise and realized they were sitting on a veritable goldmine of famous and not-so-famous DC superheroes. Writer David S. Goyer had pitched a new Superman film to Christopher Nolan, who, with some of his own tweaks, took the idea to Warner Brothers, and Zack Snyder was hired to direct the film. Even though Man of Steel was conceived as a standalone story, Snyder would lay minimal groundwork for a shared universe with Easter eggs like a glimpse of a Wayne Enterprises satellite. When talks of a Man of Steel sequel began, Snyder in the studio saw the monstrous profits of Marvel's interconnected universe as a sign that audiences were ready for a cohesive DC movie universe. And so, at San Diego Comic-Con in 2013, Zack Snyder announced that the follow-up to Man of Steel would not be Man of Steel 2, but rather a team-up of two of the most popular characters ever created, Batman and Superman. While Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice prepared to launch the DC Extended Universe, the studio was already looking for the next property to include. They settled on Suicide Squad, a title they had been trying to adapt since 2009. The movie would be based on John Ostrander's comic series about captured C-list villains performing high-risk missions to reduce their prison sentences. As usual for big, expensive tentpole movies, a release date is announced years in advance to claim a certain weekend. For Suicide Squad, that was August 5th, 2016, just four months after Batman vs Superman was set to hit screens. The expectation was that a showdown between those A-list heroes would surely be a billion dollar hit and could help carry the lesser known characters of Suicide Squad to their own box office success, while also setting the stage for the ultimate DC comic movie, Justice League. David Ayer, then known primarily for gritty dramatic thrillers like Training Day, Harsh Times, and End of Watch, was hired in late 2014 to write and direct this collection of comic book villains. With the release date set in stone and promotional deals already made, Ayer only had a few weeks to write his script in order to stay on track for the strict deadline. When it was time to cast this band of misfits, Tom Hardy was originally set to play military leader Rick Flagg but dropped out due to scheduling conflicts with The Revenant, which had run far over schedule. The studio then went to Ayer's End of Watch star, Jake Gyllenhaal, who declined their offer outright. They finally landed on the recently rebooted Robocop, Joel Kinnaman. There were more challenges trying to cast cold-hearted government official Amanda Waller, with the role first offered to Oprah Winfrey. Octavia Spencer was also considered, until they became aware that respected actor Viola Davis had expressed interest in playing the ruthless character. Even though it now seems unimaginable for anyone but Margot Robbie to embody flexible psychiatrist-turned-psychopath Harley Quinn, that wasn't the studio's original intention. They had offered the role to Emma Roberts, who turned it down to star in the short-lived show Scream Queens. Whoops! 
The role of expert assassin Floyd Lawton, aka Deadshot, was the hardest to cast. The studio had several names on their wish list, including John Hamm, Keanu Reeves, Idris Elba, and Matt Damon. Matt Damon! Ultimately, they ended up scoring Will Smith. Ayer originally wanted his Fury co-star, Shia LaBeouf, to play Navy SEAL GQ Edwards, but the actor said the studio rejected the idea, and the role went to Scott Eastwood. LaBeouf later said that the GQ character and a number of other supporting roles were reduced to add more scenes for Smith's Deadshot. Much to the dismay of David Ayer, who saw the film as more of a Dirty Dozen-style collaboration rather than a star vehicle for any one performer. The rest of the disposable Task Force X members were filled out by Jai Courtney as Rowdy Ozzy Captain Boomerang, Arewale Akinoye Agbaje as Reptilian Cannibal Killer Croc, Jay Hernandez as Flamethrowing Gangbanger El Diablo, Karen Fukuhara as Flag's deadly sword-swinging bodyguard Katana, and Kara Delevingne as the Dark Magic Entity Enchantress. Last but certainly not least was the iconic role of the Joker. The studio originally offered the Clown Prince of Crime to Ryan Gosling, who passed because he did not want to sign on to a project that had clear plans for sequels. So they turned to recent Academy Award winner Jared Leto to put his own twist on the demented criminal. With the primary cast in place and a release date looming, a shortened period of rehearsals began before cameras rolled in April 2015. It seems Ayer had an interesting take on this process, inviting some of the actors to his house to engage in fistfights, saying, you learn about who a person really is when you punch them in the face. Sure, that's totally normal. He also reportedly told Cara Delevingne that the key to unlocking her character's movements was to go out into the woods by herself and walk naked under the full moon, which apparently she did, for whatever that was worth. Ayer also brought in a police interrogator to grill the cast, so he could find out some of their deepest, darkest secrets, and then, when they were filming, he would bring up those profoundly personal matters in order to draw a performance out of his actors, and he would blame the Joker. Of course, no one made more headlines than Jared Leto and his off-screen antics. An admitted method actor, Leto refused to rehearse with the rest of the cast, as he wanted to keep the isolation between the characters fresh. The gifts that Leto sent to the cast have almost become more famous than the film itself. He sent a live rat to Margot Robbie, with other cast members receiving boxes full of dirty magazines, sex toys, and, most unpleasant of all, used condoms. It was also reported that one day, while the entire cast was at a table read, Leto hired a henchman to enter and say, special delivery from Mr. J, before dumping a bullet-riddled pig carcass on the table. What fun! Ayer seemingly loved Leto's commitment to the character, and approved of the vulgar shenanigans, saying, the Joker is something you have to be. Every actor on the team physically pushed themselves to their limits with martial arts and firearms training, weightlifting, and fight choreography, with Margot Robbie performing gymnastics and even learning to hold her breath for nearly five minutes for the underwater scene. Of course, it wasn't all super serious on the set, like when David Ayer made the mistake of entering Jai Courtney's trailer while the actor was butt naked, prompting Courtney to playfully chase his director around the set in his birthday suit. The actors and crew also seemed to enjoy their bonding experience enough to give each other matching squad tattoos, which in hindsight may not have been a sound decision. At San Diego Comic-Con in 2015, fans were treated to their first glimpse of Suicide Squad with a trailer that had a darker tone. A bootlegged version leaked online within hours of its debut, resulting in Warner Brothers officially releasing the footage days later. This sent fan anticipation through the roof. Ayer would later tweet that this footage was a closer representation of his original vision for the film. But in March 2016, Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice was released, and it failed to meet Warner Brothers' expectations by not hitting the billion dollars they had anticipated. It also received lukewarm reviews for the movie's predominantly grim tone. This infuriated the studio's then-CEO, Kevin Sujihara, who feared the disappointing response to the big-screen meeting between two of the world's most recognizable superheroes had irrevocably damaged their entire DC brand. Sujihara looked at the reactions to another recently released comic book adaptation that had garnered much praise, Deadpool. His takeaway was that audiences were clamoring for a more amusing take on the material, so he brought in the team at Trailer Park to cut together a new teaser for Suicide Squad, resulting in the well-received Bohemian Rhapsody trailer. The movie also underwent expensive reshoots around this time, with rumors that the goal was to lighten the overall tone and add more humor. David Ayer refuted this at the time, but has since admitted that scenes were reshot because they were initially considered too dark, particularly Joker's torture of Harley. After the success of the new trailer, Tsuchihara decided to go behind his director's back and actually hired the Trailer Park team to re-edit the entire film, in order to make it more like the trailer they cut. 
They took a cue from the success of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy and how it handled mostly unknown comic characters by using prolonged introductions and popular rock songs. And they weren't messing around with the familiar music. Suicide Squad has four different needle drops in just the first five minutes. Ayer became aware that the studio had two cuts of the film, his darker version with more focus on the Joker as the primary antagonist, and the studio's much lighter take, with over an hour of Leto's Joker removed, shifting him from the main villain to a secondary character with no real purpose. If you were in Northern California in 2016, you may have been among the few who got a chance to see Ayer's cut of the film, as the studio ran several test screenings of the competing cuts to see which version tested better. Reactions to the original cut made their way online, with people loving the amped up roles for both Joker and Batman. When the theatrical version was eventually released, those same people noted that the altered cut was vastly inferior to the version they had originally seen. In the end, Warner Brothers decided that neither cut was 100% right, and decided to mash the two together, creating a confused final product that whiplashed between Ayer's darker tone and the studio's more humorous take. Ayer said that he understood the studio's business decision to lighten up the film after Batman vs Superman got accused of being too dark, but he added that Suicide Squad was never meant to be in the vein of Deadpool, and even described his version as a soulful drama. But he accepted that his name was on the film, even if it wasn't actually the film he had made. The cost of the production had eventually ballooned to $175 million, raising the risk and the studio's concerns. But despite the struggles behind the scenes, Suicide Squad arrived on its August 5, 2016 release date. The general reception was more negative than positive, with critics calling it baffling, incoherent, and a wasted opportunity. Many noted the senseless plot in which mastermind Amanda Waller assembles a special supervillain team whose first mission is to rescue her from a member of her own supervillain team. The movie was also criticized for an undercurrent of sexism and misogyny. She had a mouth. <laughs> Notably, the abuse and objectification of Harley Quinn and her literally toxic relationship with Joker. But the film defied those bad reviews with a record-breaking domestic opening on the way to a worldwide total of nearly 750 million, passing Man of Steel and the eventual box office for Justice League. Not bad for a troubled movie featuring obscure characters. It also won an Academy Award for Best Makeup and Hairstyling, so there's that. After the movie's release, Jared Leto expressed frustration that what he filmed was not represented on the screen, claiming there was enough footage on the cutting room floor to piece together an entire Joker film. Even details like the Joker's damaged tattoo had more depth than the original cut, with Ayer explaining that after the villain killed Robin, Batman smashed his teeth before dropping him at Arkham Asylum and the Joker's forehead message was a reference to how his smile was permanently damaged because of Batman. In response to the jumbled mess of the final theatrical edit, Ayer simply responded, the timeline was changed after filming. Other substantial differences reportedly included a climactic team-up between Joker and Enchantress, a Deadshot and Harley romance, Katana becoming possessed and turning on the team, and Diablo surviving the finale. And then in 2017 came Justice League. The dire box office take and critical reception led to one of the biggest bombs in recent history. After the turmoil behind the scenes was brought to light, ardent fans of Zack Snyder and the DC movies pushed the hashtag release the Snyder Cut. At the time, it was simply a rallying cry by zealous fans to see the director's original vision, but it became an incessant demand. By 2020, Kevin Sujihara had exited the studio amid a scandal and was replaced by Anne Sarnoff as CEO. The rise of streaming during the pandemic saw the launch of Warner's HBO Max, and the company wanted something unique that could attract an audience to this new service, something like the Snyder Cut of Justice League. In May of 2020, Zack Snyder confirmed that his version of Justice League would indeed be released on HBO Max. Those relentless online fans would finally get what they wanted. Of course, once the Snyder Cut actually became a reality, those persistent fans then turned their attention to Suicide Squad, trending the hashtag release the air cut. Ayer himself joined in, tweeting about the differences and stating that assembling his cut wouldn't take much time or money. But Anne Sarnoff had the veto stamp, saying, we will not be developing David Ayer's cut. The director replied on Twitter by asking why. The simplest answer could be that they have just moved on. When Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn was temporarily fired by Disney, Warners pounced and hired him for a new version of the property, dubbed The Suicide Squad. Not quite a sequel, or strictly a reboot, the movie demonstrates that the studio is no longer precious about maintaining its shared cinematic universe, allowing Gunn to retain some of the original Suicide Squad cast, but not necessarily their character continuity. Just before the release of Gunn's movie, David Ayer posted one final heartfelt comment on Twitter, 
further distancing himself from the studio cut and describing his own version of Suicide Squad as an intricate and emotional journey with some bad people. After a word of praise for Gunn's own spin on the material, Ayer said he would no longer speak publicly on the matter. And with that, it seems we will never see David Ayer's true vision of Suicide Squad. Unless maybe one day HBO Max is running low on comic material and needs a quick boost, and they check their vault to find a whole lot of extra footage for Joker, Batman, Deadshot, Harley Quinn, and the rest of Ayer's Suicide Squad. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company, and we appreciate your support.